Father had said, your brothers have been out taking care of the flock near Shechem. Go and look for them. So he goes out looking for them, doesn't find them in the first place, and he meets a man who says they've gone further down. And when he goes there, obviously he's, you know, gentle of spirit, happy that he's going to see his brothers, not knowing that they have planned evil for him. And Joseph was rejected. He was betrayed. Literally, he was abandoned. Note, he's had two dreams that are telling him these very same guys are going to bow down to him. Right? Including his folks, isn't it? And now, at age 17, he's sold into slavery. And his life had changed dramatically. You can imagine, he, he's been living a good life. Huh? How many of you have watched the movie, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Coat? Literally, his father, you can get it on YouTube, eh? just so you know. His father made him a beautiful jacket of many colors, isn't it? That's the life he was living. His brothers didn't get that coat, only he did. But now, he's been abandoned and betrayed. And even that jacket that his father gave him was taken away from him. And he goes into Egypt as a slave. And he must have felt, what is happening to me? This dream I had really is not amounting to where I am right now. And as they say, his state has changed. He was the favored son in Canaan, and now he's a slave. One of the things we notice, at this time of his life, he could have despaired. He could have given up everything, isn't it? But one of the things he did do is he decided, no, this is not my lot in life, and I will continue to serve God. And therefore, he found favor. Even in Potiphar's household, eh? Potiphar put him over everything, isn't it? As the word said, and I said it the last time, all Potiphar used to do was come home to sleep and eat. Joseph took care of everything. And then after that, Potiphar's wife, who obviously we know the story, laid eyes on him and decided, this is the man. But he refused. Because he said, I cannot sin against God. He was very clear about that. So he's come from a place where he was the favored son. He's become a slave. He's still faithful to God. He's been put over Potiphar's household. And then Potiphar's wife decides, Afana, this is what I want. And because you won't give it to me, I will lie. And through that lie, he was thrown into jail. I don't think jail looks like anything we see on Prison Break or any of those movies that we talk about, isn't it? In fact, they call it a what? A dungeon. What does a dungeon spike of? When you think about a dungeon in your head, what is it? It's a cave. It's a hole. You're being thrown underneath. You're being removed from life itself and being separated somewhere. Where in my mind, there's no light. It's all darkness, isn't it? And that's where Joseph found himself. Favored son, slave, head of a household, dungeon. Then he interprets two dreams, isn't it? And he told these guys, because he knows. See, as guys know, if you're close to a leader here in Kenya, see, things work out for you. Do not forget me, isn't it? You go to the leaders and you get whatever it is, you know, because of that closeness, isn't it? Yeah? I know people who come to me and tell me that uh, they know that if I only say the word, they'll be able to see the governor. And I realize these guys don't know how it works. It's not that easy. Just because I'm close to him doesn't mean I can walk into his office anytime, isn't it? And I believe that was the same thing that the cupbearer, who was the one whose head wasn't taken off, isn't it, had. And even when Joseph told him, remember me, the guy went, three days later his dream came true, but what happened? He forgot. And Joseph was where? Still waiting in the 
dungeon. I would like to think he was very patient. Despite all this, thinking, you know, Lord, I am here, but what is this you want of me? What is it that you're looking for me to do? You gave me a dream, but I am in a hole. It doesn't make sense. However, if we look at the whole issue of patience in our lives, I'd like to look, read some scripture and just remove it from where Joseph was and come now uh, to, to the New Testament. In Romans 12, 12, 12, it says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And I believe Joseph was patient in that affliction because he found favor again with the head of the jail who put him again over everybody. But I don't think that was the kind of everybody he wanted because they were still in a dungeon in a hole, eh? <laughs> literally in my mind. But it was a good thing because he had leadership qualities that they could see. If you look at 1 Peter 4.19, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. We're commanded. It's, it's not something that the, 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 the scripture is the same in the New Testament as it, as it was in the Old, isn't it? And I believe that even as Joseph went through what he went through, he held on to that. For the man that, that is not scripture by the way, so don't ask me where it's from, but it's a good word that I got from somebody. For the man that follows God, there is nothing accidental. For the man that follows God, there is nothing accidental. God has a plan for your life. He knows exactly what's going to happen blow by blow. Sometimes at the end of it all, we are impatient. We are the ones who are impatient. We want things to move a lot faster than they should. And we are always in that space where we are thinking, I have been praying, Lord, why isn't it coming to pass? I have been praying, why isn't it coming to pass? Days have turned into weeks, have turned into months, have turned into years. And you actually, at some point in our human nature, some of us stop praying, isn't it? We tell the Lord, Iyo, unajua. You know it, and I'm not going to pray about it anymore. Doesn't that spike of impatience? That at the end of it all, you're not trusting and believing that the Lord will do that for you? One of the things that got me is when I was going through this, it was very clear that God knew exactly what he had planned for Joseph. Exactly. And you can see it in Psalms. Not even in, in, in Genesis. In Psalms. Psalms 105 uh, verse 17 to 22. And he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons till what he foretold came to pass. Till the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him. The ruler of people set him free. He made him master of his household, ruler over all he possessed, to instruct his princes as he pleased and teach his elders wisdom. Do you see that? It was actually God that sent Joseph to Egypt. If you look at Psalms 105, 17, 22. And he basically says when he meets up with his brothers, now you know how the story goes, eh? He interprets uh, Pharaoh's dream, meets up with his brothers, and uh, he then says to them, 45, Genesis 45, 7 to 9, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth. Can you imagine? It is said that Joseph spent 13 years in Egypt. Be the, between the time he was sold in as a slave to the time that he actually stood in front of Pharaoh. How many of us here have prayed for 13 years? Let alone, actually, one month. Let's start with one month. Have prayed for one month, diligently looking for something. How many? Two? 
three it's years, isn't it? And sometimes things don't happen the way you really exactly want them to happen. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. In 13 years, he was able to realize it wasn't his brothers. The Lord had a bigger plan for him. So he's beginning to see what his dreams meant. At that time, he dreamt. He didn't know how it was going to come to pass, isn't it? But he begins to see what his dreams meant. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. In the word it says, he was the highest ranking official. Now, can you imagine when he was a 17-year-old boy looking for his brothers around Shechem and ending up where he was? Did he know he was going to become a ruler? Couldn't have. After all, they had taken him, removed his beautiful jacket, and thrown him into a cistern. A dry well. It's actually a dry well. Then he says to them, now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. Now we see the second dream coming to pass, isn't it? That you will. The sun and the moon and all the the 11 stars bowed down to him. So his brothers came first. It is said that when they landed, when they were told by their father um, to go forth, it was, it was because they were hungry, isn't it? And when they landed in front of Joseph, what did they do? They, they bowed. But there were 10 of them at the time because Benjamin had been left behind. Right? If you go to 50, 19 to 20, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. I'm in the place of God. You, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So let's go back and take a look at patience as concerns Joseph's life. Patience is something that we need. I remember when I used to go through uh, appraisals, and I used to hate it because they would give you questions and says, that would say, put down your greatest weaknesses. How in the world do you expect? So my standard response, number one, was impatience. And then they write, explain, isn't it? I want things to happen quickly, now. And I have no time to wait for it. That's what I constantly used to say. And that was in the, work, the, the workspace. And with time, I realized there was a lot more that I need to go, needed to get to understand. Even in my impatience and I wanted to ha things to happen now, I also had to put these things before God and let him be the one to guide me in the direction that he needed me to take. Right? There are times that we're praying for things. We're really, really praying. I have a friend. Um, we were in school together. One of these uh, Ladies who have always been in my life. We started in primary school, went from standard one to form four, right? And um, in school, we were friends, but never in the same group, if you know what I mean, isn't it? Then we lost touch when we went to campus, because I went to university and she went elsewhere. And then, hey presto, we ended up working for the same company. And... Uh, I'll use her name, uh, Debbie falls sick. And many of us wondered what it was all about. And she would spend days in hospital. Um, sooner or later, I left that company that we were working together in, um, and I thought she had gotten better. And then much later, I get a message that your friend is very sick in hospital. We don't think she's going to make it. But she did. She made it. But the result of that illness was that she lost her hearing. So you can imagine somebody who has heard all her life suddenly not hearing anymore, right? Even talking, this was an experience that I looked at and we all started praying for her and we would pray and pray that the Lord would heal her. And the Lord did heal her, but the only thing that got left behind was, and we used to joke around about that, 
And somebody who could talk like me stopped talking. And I kept asking the Lord, how is this possible? And the one thing we used to communicate fully on text, because you know whenever she'd call, in fact she would call you to get your attention and then switch to text. And Debbie one time said, the only thing I want to do is hear. When she felt sick, she was not a Christian, but in between, she did give her life to the Lord. And she began to believe that her healing was coming. And so she, they, they set up a harambe. And I remember they spent a lot of money on it. And I asked her one question. Do you think you should be spending this amount of money? Because the amount you spent could start your treatments, right? And then she says, no, I have faith that the Lord will provide and as Harambees go, nobody came. We were very few of us. And so they'd spent the money but didn't make any money on top of that. And time went on and many of us got moved on here and there and she had this knack of keeping in touch with us. And she was still praying and she would text, text, text. So the other day she texted me and she told me, you know what, I woke up very early and, and I know, I, I felt it in my spirit that the Lord was saying, I'm going to hear. And you know, I, so, sometimes you want to write back and, you know, encourage, but I didn't have words of encouragement at that point. So she'd gone out and she'd done her homework about a doctor in Italy. No one knew who that doctor was. And that, that doctor comes to Kenya to handle cochlear implants because that was the part of her ear that was damaged. And so I said, okay. So whereas we started off looking for four million Kenya shillings, it dropped to two million, actually three. And then it came down to um, roughly about two million that we were looking for. And we went on and so one day I just decided, I asked her what happened. Um, she, we had raised some money so we knew we had a certain amount of money. Somebody advised her and she went and put it into shares and she lost part of the money so me i'm sitting there and i'm saying lord this this lady has this faith and has always held on to you what is happening and we we would talk and she would actually don't ask me what both of us would be doing awake at that time of the morning she would she had a knack of texting me back and forth at 4 a.m so we'd be back and forth with each other and she would say, this is the time I woke up to pray. To cut a long story short, um, we managed to collect the money. I remember we just sat and she said one day, the Lord said, you are the one to give me the cash. And I was like, <laughs> Lord, <laughs> you have not spoken to me as well. <laughs> and that was my unbelief, isn't it? But I prayed about it and the Lord just told me, put an appeal on your Facebook page. And I did. And we collected the full amount she required. And it fell from 2 to 1.3 million. That was what she required. Today, Debbie hears. She's still learning how to speak again. But today, Debbie hears. Why? Because she waited. She was patient. Very, very patient. How many years did she wait? 12. As I was sitting there praising the Lord, that story dropped in my spirit. And I thought to myself, actually, one year less than Joseph. She called me the other day, and at first I was going to kill the call, usually. Eh? You see her call, you kill it, and then you start to text. But she called me back. And for the first time, she was forming words again. And that is patience, isn't it? And that is healing. She underwent the cochlear implant, and that was healing through the hands of God healed through the hands of man. But she waited for close to 12 years. Fact is, we go through trials and tribulations, isn't it? And we wonder, what is God telling us in all this? 
I had a scare about um, four years ago, actually, four, four, five years ago. And I remembered it this week when I was sharing with my sister because I didn't even know I had a growth in my neck. Many of you, if you look at me properly, you'll see it. And I remember sitting at the table and my brother was visiting and he looks at me and looks at me and he's a doctor and he says, what's that on your neck? And he gets up and he feels my neck and he says, you've got a growth in your neck. I've never seen it. And so I went to the doctor. He said, you need to go and get it checked. I went to the doctor and obviously was told you have a thyroid problem. At that time, everything about me was like this. My weight was seesaw. Everything was just going crazy. And the fear gripped me because when anybody says you have a growth, what's the first thing you think about? Cancer. And I think he noticed I had gotten a bit. And he says, no, don't worry. Let's just get it checked. Some growths are not cancerous. So I go to a certain doctor and uh, she quickly tells me, go and do these tests. And she finishes and she says, you need to get, uh, be operated on. And uh, I looked at her like, and she says, it needs to be done now. If it's not done now, things are bad. And you can imagine, you want your doctor to, to be able to talk to you positively, nicely, isn't it? This was not being positive. When she tells you about you know, and I was in her waiting room with people with huge, she's an endocrinologist, huge growths. She said, you will turn out like that. And I told the Lord, now, please, this is not my lot in life. I have ministered, I have done the things you want me to do. At that time, I was actually in between jobs as well. I had actually quit a job that... Um, was paying me very well, and I quit it because my spirit was not at ease with what was happening in the company. And so I've just quit a job, and then I'm given this diagnosis. It doesn't work. And so she said, you need to go and see the surgeon. I don't cut myself. In fact, she said that. I don't cut myself. I'm like, I feel like a piece of meat, that you're going to come and cut me open, like the way you will cut nyama to cook, isn't it? And I remember my, my sister was sitting beside me, rather quiet, right? She later reveals to me is that she started to pray. And she was like, this is not going to happen. Because there had been a lot of things happening within the family that we were just wondering, Lord, what is this? So we go to this other doctor. He takes a look at me, and he was very pleasant. And he says, I need to do two more tests. One of them will be very unpleasant, but I need you to do it. Um, and so we went, and yes, it was unpleasant. And I also realized that I should have, it should have been done with anesthetic. It was not. And everybody looks at me today and tells me, how did you do that test without anesthesia? They literally take a needle this long and push it into your neck. And uh, later on, I discovered that was a cancer test that he was doing. And as I went home and sat, it was the longest five days of my life. And I remember all of us just prayed and prayed and prayed. And when we went back to see the doctor, because me, I told the Lord, as I walked in, I said, in fact, I told my sister, why are we here? See, we've prayed, and we believe. So why have we come for results? Yeah, see, we stay at home because we know that the Lord has already done it. And then she says, where? We still need to find out what the tests have said. So I said, okay, fine, let's go. And the doctor looked at me, and he said something very interesting. He says, you have a very beautiful neck. And I'm looking at my sister, and through my head, I'm thinking, this man cannot be flirting with me in front of my sister. <laughs> and then he says, so I don't see why I should be cutting it open. And we looked at him, and I was still at the fact that he was flirting with me. And then my sister picked up on it and said, um, so is it, there's nothing. He said, really, no. It, sometimes you get abnormal growths within your thyroid, but it's not cancer. And unless you are uncomfortable with the little bump on your neck, I don't see why I should operate. And that was healing right there, because all the tests the other doctor had done had pointed to it being a major problem. And I looked at it and I said, these are trials and that come your way. Some of them resolve very quickly. My friends took 12 years. Mine took 
two weeks between the first diagnosis and the final. And I'll say this, the fact that we may be going through tribulation and discomfort does not necessarily mean that we are walking out of the will and the plan of God. Doesn't mean that God loves you any less. We've had people scream, God, why, why, why? Why does this have to happen to me? It doesn't. It just means he has got a plan for you, a better plan. And the truth of the matter is, during that two weeks, I was supposed to make an important decision that would have moved my life in another direction. And those two weeks slowed me down. And my life went totally opposite from where it should have gone. And that was God. When we are asked to patiently wait, how many of you are waiting for something in here, whatever it might be? How many? And when you look at it, the Lord is saying, do not despair. It can be answered, in my case, in two weeks, in the case of my friend, 12 years, in the case of Joseph, 13, isn't it? And then again, it may not be answered the way you want it to be. Many of us think life needs to be, you get up in the morning and everything is hunky-dory, isn't it? You get up and you move on in life. But those trials and tribulations do come. And many a time I find that they come to make us stronger. If you look at Matthew 7, 24, it says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He promises that he will be with us in our darkest hour. If we hear his words and we act according to them. One of the things Joseph did very clearly was he believed, isn't it? And because he believed and he did what the Lord asked him to, he found favor with God. You'd wonder what kind of favor is it being in a dark dungeon? But the truth of the matter is it came. At that time, he was put in charge of people in the dungeon. Right? Much later, he got out of the dungeon. If you look at Deuteronomy 31, 6, and I'll just go through a couple of scriptures. It says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So no matter what you're waiting for, the Lord will not leave you nor forsake you. Isaiah 40, 27 to 31. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you, Israel, why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I will continue reading from the word. Psalms 118, verse 5 to 9. When hard-pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. When things are thick, and I find many people do that. And I find it very strange. You look for people who know people who know people to help you, isn't it? Who is the biggest person you need to know? And if it is for you, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Sometimes he will not let you go because our human nature wants certain things, isn't it? 
But Lord, the Lord in his wisdom knows that this right here is not good for you. So when you come, and I've, I, I got a phone call one time a Sunday night at 10 o'clock at night, a guy called me and said, hello. And I said, uh, normally I look at a number at that time. If it's not a number I know, I, I, I begin to wonder. But don't ask me why I picked it up. And this guy was calling to ask me for a job. In Atakakwa Askari, wa county. And I wondered, where did he get my number? Yeah? And he said, I have been told, if I speak to you, Kwisha Maneno. And at first I told him, first of all, haven't you also been told that calling people at this time of the night is disrespectful? And that one quishes the maneno. He apologized, but you see, at the end of the day, he had put his faith in, in that call, and in me, a mere human, isn't it? To get the job that he wanted. And sometimes that is the mistake that we make as human beings. Hebrews 13.5 Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. How many times is it said in the Bible? Many, many times. So sometimes I wonder, the Lord must be wondering, you're going to chopper this woman over the head. How many times, or any of you, this man, this child, do I have to say, I will never leave you, no? Forsake you. I remember when I started to work I, and, and I looked for the job that I was going to do because of money. And I was already a Christian at that time. Eh? A young Christian though, but I was already a Christian. And, and being successful in life was about the money you made. And the money you made then rolled over into the car you drove, isn't it? And the car you drive rides out into the people you hang out with. I'd like to ask Proverbs 4.23. Uh, just get that for me. And one of the things that got me at the time was, even as a Christian, I was tithing, and I was successful. But I realized many, many years later that I had put my success in the value of what the world thinks success is, isn't it? Yeah? Do you think you're successful if you can wake up in the morning and have life? Are you saying that now because I've asked it in this context? <laughs> or is that really what you believe? Are you successful because you wake up and you're breathing? Many of us don't believe that. We believe success comes with Shamba, Gari, Bibi if you're a man, Mume if you're a woman, and beautiful kids. And I honor you for your testimony here today. Because you also waited patiently, 54 days and 100 and, and 53. That was the Lord working through you and your family. Because many people would have given up. Why, Lord, why? You know, we've waited for these children for so long. Why? But that's about being patient. And for me, I did rise up the ladder pretty fast. And so I got to all the material things that went with rising up the ladder. I was almost earning a seven-figure salary by the time I quit. Because then I realized my life had become about that. And at some point, even that seven figures, if you look at it, was going through my fingers very quickly. And so I left. Now at, this, at the county, I'm earning six figures, and I'm actually very happy. Because I feel that it is what I am doing for others that matters, not what money will do for me, isn't it? I keep laughing at my friends because at some point with my friends, I even sold the car that I walked into the county with. So I was driving when I went to the county, Sasa, Nina, Tembea. Yeah? But it is okay, isn't it? 
Simply because at one point I thought that car had become an idol. And I'm not the kind of person who says Shindre all the time, but I just felt if it is that I'm spending all the time thinking about this car and fuel and what and what, and guess what? When I started thinking that it had become an idol, I got a buyer even when I wasn't looking for one. Somebody landed in my office and said, you have a car, we'd like to buy it from you. And I said, eh, and then what do I end up with? And it was the people who I bought the car from, my, my, the, the dealer, Subaru. They came to me and they said, this, this, th we want to know whether you can sell your car. Remember the day you did evaluation? I said, yes. We put it in the file by mistake and somebody wants your car. And I looked up. You must have thought that was crazy because I looked up like, Lord, I was praying this morning. You don't answer immediately. But it is true. Keep your lives free from the love of money. The minute I let go of that car, it's been one and a half years I haven't had a car and I don't want for anything. Right? And I'm content. And I'd like to ask you all to be content. Even though, and I know that there are those things and I saw the hands go up and we will pray. We will take that time, Pastor, uh, 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 after this, to just pray. Because we do know it's not about the answered prayer immediately. It's about the patience to wait through it. So it's patiently waiting. Quickly, I'll just take you through and uh, Stephen, just hold on to that one that I asked you to get me. Ecclesiastes, because I don't want to paraphrase it. I know what it says, but I don't want to paraphrase it. I want to read it as it is. Ecclesiastes 7, 8, the end of a matter is better than its beginning and patience is better than pride. I had become, if this is an English word, prideful, like insightful, but yes. Proverbs 19, 11, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. What did Joseph do? He overlooked the offense of his brothers. He was just happy that the Lord used him to go ahead of them into Egypt, to interpret Pharaoh's dream, and then to be there when there was famine in Canaan as well, to receive them back so that the, the, the people of, they are now called the people of Israel, 12 tribes, isn't it, would not be annihilated through that drought. Romans 8.28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God loved Joseph, and I know God loves each and every one of us sitting in this room, and we too should love him the same way Joseph did. We can't say we love God and do other things, by the way. That's a sermon for another day. But we can't say that. I couldn't say I loved God and had this thing that kept me busy. I could be out sorting out things for my car rather than going for fellowship or Bible study. And then I, I make an excuse to my buddies. Something came up that was important that I had to handle. Fixing my car's puncture. As important as that. Romans 5, 3 to 5, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, the other word for perseverance is patience. In other, in actually in other uh, uh, versions, they use the word patience. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. James 1, 2 to 4, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Another word for perseverance? Patience. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I believe the 13 years Joseph waited made him mature, isn't it? He went through hardship. That means he doesn't think everything comes on a, a, a silver platter. Like most of us think in this life, the youth are thinking that uh, hang around with politicians. All you need to do is wait for the crumbs to fall, isn't it? 
And nowadays, when the politicians are not giving the money, they are getting very upset. In fact, the word is tutakutua. Asubui na mapema. Eight. Why? Because he didn't get 200 shillings. You see how crazy it is? We have to begin to know that we have to work for whatever we have. We have to persevere. It's not about hanging around the right people. It's, around hang it's about hanging around the right person. Yeah? We need patience to do the will of God. And though we may not like it, patience is built through trials. That for me was an eye opener. Because at one point I said, Lord, why is it that we go through these things? I remember when I was sitting in front of the doctor, one of the issues I had with being told I had to go through another operation is that it would have been my third. And, uh, and I, uh, all the other three were for different, very different areas. And if anyone who has recovered from an operation in this room, in the area between here and here, even coughing is a problem. You can't sit up, you can't sit. I thought to myself, now, here, Lord. But the fact was this. I'm a stronger person. Because I do know, even if the Lord does not answer it the way I want, he will answer. Early this year, my uncle went to be with the Lord. And it was a very, very difficult time for us as a family. Because this guy had never been really sick a day in his life. And when he did fall sick, and I remember going to visit him, and it was cancer, and we sat outside his house, uh, and we were talking, and he went on, and he, you know, he just told us what the Lord has been doing, and I sat there, and I remember I found myself praying, telling the Lord, heal this man, right? And things moved from bad to worse to worse, and he finally ended up in hospital, and was in hospital for about uh, close to three months. And I came to see him one time, and as I stood there in the room, something fell on my spirit that this was it. And I remember walking out of that room with my sisters and my cousins, and I kept, I kept quiet, and I didn't say a word. And I remember asking the Lord, what do you mean this is it? This can never be it. And we had prayed and prayed. And then when he finally did go to be with the Lord, and I stood there looking at his body, he had such peace on his face because the guy I had seen was in pain absolute pain but as I stood there and I looked at him it was like he had a smile and I said you know what through the tears in my eyes and all that and I told the Lord you know I'm looking at him and I Lord I see a smile is this what you meant this is the healing that he's now with you and no longer with us and yes, we will cry, and yes, we'll go through all the trials of putting, laying his body to rest. But at the end of the day, I had to tell the Lord, this was your will. And for us, it was a trial. Because suddenly we had a hospital bill of close to seven million to clear. And many of us are wondering, where do we get seven million from? But guess what? Exactly a month after the funeral, everything was cleared. That was God. And we still go through the trials of missing our uncle, but at the end of the day, we look at the providence of God. And we'll patiently wait. I won't go through that last slide. Um, but one of the things that struck me, this is a, a quote by Oswald Chambers, at times God will appear like an unkind friend, but he is not. He will appear like an unjust judge, but he is not. I urge you all, trials and tribulations do come. Keep praying for the things that you're looking for. Patiently wait, persevere, because when they are answered, it will be beyond your wildest dreams. I'd like to just take this moment, if there's anyone, even as we, as we close, if there's anyone who would stand, just stand where you are. Stand for yourself, for the things that you're praying for. If there are things that you know 
you, your family has been looking for, stand in the gap, stand right there for your family members. All your friends, just let's stand and let's, let's pray. If you want to take that step and move forward, feel quite free, I will ask, and I should have uh, introduced her, and I will, as we, as we end the service, I'll ask Esther and Stephen to help me with this, and Pastor, and anybody who's in your prayer team, let's just spend that time giving back and telling the Lord, opening our spirits, your spirit for the things that are holding you down. Begin to pray and never give up. For the Lord says he will never leave you nor forsake you. Guard your hearts. It is said in Proverbs 4.23 Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Keep your heart focused. Keep your mouth free of perversity. That is verse 24. Keep corrupt talk far away from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead and fix your gaze directly before you. 
verse 26 says, Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. As you pray, look into your hearts if there's anything in your life that you know now may be grieving the heart of God. Confess that and then come before God and ask for whatever it is that you require. for forgiveness if you're unable to forgive others forgive first for you to be able to receive for that person with a family issue start with true forgiveness and the Lord will forgive you and the Lord will grant you the desires of your heart Father, even as we end, as I end this sermon, I pray, Lord God, that you would be with us during this week, that in everything we would remain steadfast, in everything that we would keep our hearts pure, even as we wait upon the things, and as we patiently wait for you to respond to